Pastor Luke's actually the one who's going to be heading up that class. So if you know somebody who has just recently given their life to the Lord, uh, but they're not really sure where to go from there, uh, this would be a great class to get plugged into. And so that starts next Sunday in the T-Building. And you can actually text the word CLASS to 88988. We're going to send you a link, and it's going to have a lot of details with that. So if you are interested, text CLASS to 889. Eight, eight, and we can get you registered for that class beginning next week. So what we're going to do is I'm going to pray, and then we're going to begin worship. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you so much, God, uh, for allowing us to serve with you. And Lord, we pray for the many of the new believers that have just given their life to the Lord. And I pray that this class be a great resource to them. And Lord, we just pray that today many give their lives to you as well. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Good morning, Valley Baptist. Let's stand together. Let's begin our time singing this old hymn, the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above.
Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him over and over. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust. Be mad. 
lift this up and sing it out. Oh, Christ. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. The altar of my life. the days are coming, says the Lord, that I will raise to David a branch of righteousness. A king shall reign and prosper and execute judgment and righteousness in the earth. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell safely. Now this is his name by which he will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Amen. Sins are forgiven. 
The Father's will complete. He reigns in victory. Yes, he does. Offered up our praise to you through our songs, through our worship. As we bowed our hearts before you, God, would you now speak to us through your word? Would each one of us leave here changed forever with a better understanding of who you are, of what you have done? God, with the grace to apply it to our lives day in and day out. We love you. We thank you. We praise you in the mighty name of Jesus. We pray and sing. And all God's people said, Amen. Great seeing you. You may be seated. Well, good morning. I want to welcome those who are watching online or on TV, as well as those who are joining us from my home base the Olive Drive campus. Now, this last week, I got cleared to walk. In fact, the date that I was allowed to walk on was the 4th of July. So that was a, amen. That was a, an additional kind of uh, freedom and independence that I was celebrating on the 4th, I guess. Uh, but Pastor Andrew and the rest of the family are in Oklahoma right now. I was there too, but I flew back a few days early to preach the sermon to give the rest of the family a few extra days with Pastor Roger there in Oklahoma. 
But on Sunday mornings, we've been going through the New Testament book of Ephesians. And the book of Ephesians really has two main sections. The first section is about who we are in Christ. The second half of the book is about how we're supposed to live out that identity within our daily lives. And so in that second half that we're in right now, Paul has been teaching us how to walk. Now, walk is a metaphor that means how we live our Christian life. Paul has already showed us that we need to walk in love and that we need to walk in light. But in today's passage, Paul's also going to show us that we need to walk in wisdom. What is wisdom? Well, in the Bible, wisdom means knowing how to make good, godly decisions in our daily lives. So let's begin by looking at Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 15. Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. In this passage, Paul says that we should walk circumspectly, not as fools. What does it mean to walk circumspectly? Well, circum is connected to the word circle, and spectly is connected to the word look, like spectacles or spectate. And so to walk circumspectly means that as we're walking, we're looking around at where we're going. In other words, the point that Paul's making here is that as we walk through life, we need to be careful how we are living. We need to pay close attention to the kinds of everyday decisions that we're making as we walk through the Christian life. And Paul says that as we're walking through this life, we need to redeem the time. To redeem the time means to make the most of every decision and to make sure that every moment counts. Now, Paul is not saying that we're supposed to live frantic lives, but he is saying that we're supposed to live a purposeful life. Paul's point is that we are supposed to live on purpose. So the question is, how intentional are we about using our time to live the way that God wants us to live? Are we intentional? Are we living on purpose? Paul warns us that we should be careful how we walk through this life because the days are evil. You see, the Christian life is not a walk in the park. It's a walk through a minefield. It's a walk through a battlefield. Because as we walk through this life, there are dangers all around us. And evil will fill up our time if we're not intentional about what we do with our time. Paul says in order to make wise decisions in life, we need to understand the will of the Lord. What does it mean to understand the will of the Lord? Well, I think what it means is that we understand the kind of biblical truths that Paul has been teaching in the book of Ephesians. What Jesus has done for us and how that should affect our daily decisions. You see, God's will for us, God's plan for us, is that what we say we believe actually affects how we live our daily life. Now, one of the many things I love about the Bible is that the Bible is so theological, and yet at the same time, it is so practical. And we see both of these elements in the next verse. Look with me in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, in the Christian world, there's some debate among Christians about whether it is right or wrong to drink in moderation. But what there can be no debate about is that the Bible clearly teaches that drunkenness is a sin. In fact, this passage could not get any clearer. It says, do not be drunk. I mean, that's as clear as the Bible gets, right? That this topic of drunkenness is a topic that doesn't get preached on in a lot of churches anymore, but it's amazing how often the Bible talks about it. All throughout the Bible, there are so many warnings about not getting drunk. For a few minutes, I'd like for us to just briefly look at some of these passages. Let's start in Proverbs chapter 20, 
starting in verse 1, this proverb says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. This proverb says that alcohol is a mocker. I think that means that alcohol often causes verbal fights. It makes you say things that you wouldn't have said otherwise. Now, you don't have to raise your hand. You don't have to answer out loud. But just ask yourself, have you ever gotten into an argument because of something you said while you were drunk? Now, not only can drunkenness cause verbal fights, it can actually cause physical fights. That's why verse 1 says that strong drink is a brawler. Now, again, you don't have to answer out loud, but have you ever gotten into a fist fight because you were drunk? Have you ever hit someone that you love because you were drunk? Look with me in Proverbs chapter 23, starting in verse 29. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. Those who go in search of mixed wine. This part of the proverb says that those who get drunk end up with regret, fights, accusations, and physical injuries that they don't know how they got. In verse 31 it says, Do not look on the wine when it is red, when it sparkles in the cup, when it swirls around smoothly. At the last, it bites like a serpent. This part of the proverb says, do not even look at that drink, because at the last, it will bite like a snake. What this proverb is saying is, don't be deceived by how tempting that alcohol might look at first. At the last, in the end, it stings like a viper. What this means is that that alcohol might look good for a little bit, it might taste good for a little bit, it might feel good for a little bit, But in the end, you're going to pay for it. Look with me in verse 33. It says, your eyes will see strange things, and your heart will utter perverse things. Someone who is drunk usually ends up making bad decisions and imagining things that are not true. Don't answer out loud, but have you ever made a bad decision while you were drunk? Have you ever gotten yourself in trouble because you misinterpreted a situation while you were drunk? Look at me in verse 34. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea, or like one who lies at the top of the mast, saying, they have struck me, but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? This person the proverb is talking about stumbles about, gets in fist fights that they are too drunk to win. They eventually pass out, and as soon as they regain consciousness, they start drinking again. In fact, they say, when shall I awake that I may find another drink? This is sadly the motto of a lot of people's lives. Drunkenness is especially dangerous for a leader. It's especially foolish for somebody who has responsibility in this life. Look with me at Proverbs chapter 31 in verse 4. This proverb says, it is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine nor for princes intoxicating drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the justice of all the afflicted. This proverb was written by a king named Lemuel. And this king is sharing with us some wise advice that he had gotten from his mother. And so Lemuel's mama says that kings should not be getting drunk with alcohol because they have a responsibility to those that they serve. Now, none of us are a king, but all of us have some level of responsibility in this world. And drunkenness impairs our ability to be faithful to our responsibilities. Now, don't raise your hand, but just ask yourself, have you ever dropped the ball on something because you were drunk? Look with me in the New Testament at Luke chapter 21, verse 34. Jesus says, but take heed to yourselves. That phrase sounds awfully like when Paul in Ephesians 5 says, walk circumspectly. But anyways, Luke chapter 21, verse 34, take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. 
Sinful living like drunkenness weighs us down so we're not ready for Jesus' return. Basically, what Jesus is saying in this verse is that when Jesus comes back, we wouldn't want him to find us wasting our life in drunkenness. Look with me in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 13, starting in verse 12. Paul says, Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy. Paul is saying that if we are followers of Christ, then we are supposed to throw off the works of darkness. And notice that one of the works of darkness that Paul points out is drunkenness. Look with me in Galatians, Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. Paul says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contention, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, this passage contains an ugly, long list of the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh are the kinds of sins that will characterize our lives when we are following the lead of our own sinful nature instead of following the lead of the Holy Spirit within us. And notice that one of the works of the flesh that Paul lists is drunkenness. Look with me at 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3. Peter says, For we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles, when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. Peter says, we've spent enough of our life doing the will of the Gentiles. What Peter's basically asking is he's saying, is he's saying, haven't we wasted enough of our life living like lost people live? Then he includes some examples of how lost people often waste their lives. And in these examples, he includes drunkenness and drinking parties. Throughout the Bible, we see not only these warnings against drunkenness, but we also find examples of people doing stupid, wicked things when they got drunk. For example, Noah got so drunk that he passed out naked. Nadab and Abihu got so drunk that they defiled the temple and were judged by God. And it's honestly probably too disgusting to even say out loud what happened to Lot when he got drunk. Now, the dangers of drunkenness are not only scriptural, but for me, they are also personal. I used to have a sister, a sister named Rochelle. Rochelle was my older sister. She was six years older than me, and she wasn't a believer, and she was living in Florida, and she was partying late one Saturday night. And at 3.40 a.m., she was walking across a highway in the dark. And as she did, she got hit by a truck and killed. I used to have a dad named Dale. He left us when I was very young, and he lived a wild lifestyle of drugs and alcohol. Eventually, my dad ended up homeless. I didn't really know him growing up but I would occasionally see him sleeping in the alleyway near my house. When I was an adult, I got a phone call from my grandma who let me know that my dad had died sleeping in a van in the parking lot of a casino. He had died pretty young from a heart attack. And I'm sure that my dad's wild lifestyle contributed to him dying so young. Now, those are sad stories, but the good news today is that we don't have to end up like that. Even if we've wasted our life in drunkenness, we can still be saved. We can be forgiven. We can be changed and set free. How do I know that? Because that's what it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, in verse 9. Do you not know 
that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such war some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. This passage contains a list of some of the kinds of people who do not deserve to go to heaven. And this is a pretty alarming list because all of us can find ourselves on this list somewhere, probably multiple places. But praise God that this alarming passage ends with the hope of salvation that can be had in Jesus Christ. You see, the key phrase is in verse 11, when it says, in such war, some of you. This passage shows us that there were recovered alcoholics in the early church. Did you know that there are still recovered alcoholics in our church today? Some of them sitting in this room right now. For some people, drunkenness has become an addiction. You might be sitting there saying, well, Brian, I know I want to quit. I, I know that drinking is destroying our, my life, but I just don't know how. If that's you, you're facing a way bigger challenge than we can completely cover and completely address this morning. But let me please beg you to get the help that you need. Most people need two things, professional help and a support group. Very few people quit drinking on their own. So if you need those kind of help, where can you get those two things? A great place to start is a ministry we have here at the church called Celebrate Recovery. It meets at 6 p.m. on Thursday nights at the Olive Drive campus. If you want to find out more details about it, you can go to our website, valleybaptist.org, to find out more details about our Celebrate Recovery ministry. Now, in Ephesians chapter 5, it specifically says, do not get drunk with wine, but this warning would, of course, apply to getting drunk with any kind of alcohol. It's not like we can say, oh, thank goodness Paul only mentioned wine and didn't say anything about tequila. I got a little, a little nervous there for a second. And by the way, everything the Bible says about the foolishness of getting intoxicated with alcohol can also be applied to getting high from the recreational use of marijuana and other drugs. Now, this passage in Ephesians 5, says that instead of getting drunk, Paul says that us believers are supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is the climax of this passage. This might be the climax of the entire book of Ephesians. What Paul is saying is do not be filled with alcohol, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Being filled with the Holy Spirit means handing over control of our life to the Holy Spirit. And so the point that Paul's making is that instead of being under the influence of alcohol, we're supposed to be under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That's the key to walking in wisdom, being filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, being filled with alcohol leads you to do bad things you wouldn't have done otherwise. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, on the other hand, leads you to do good things that you wouldn't have done on your own. And in the rest of this passage, Paul gives us three specific examples of what it actually looks like in our daily lives to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Those three examples are singing, thankfulness, and submission. So the first thing that it looks like to be filled with the Holy Spirit is singing to the Lord and to each other. Look with me in Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 5, this time in verse 19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. At the beginning of verse 19, it says that we are supposed to sing songs to each other. But at the end of verse 19, it says that we're supposed to sing songs to the Lord. So which is it? The songs that we sing here in church, are we supposed to be singing to each other or to the Lord? Well, the answer is both. What we see in this verse is that there is both 
a vertical and horizontal aspect to singing songs in church. You see, when we're singing in church, we're not just singing to God. We're also singing to each other. Because as we sing, yes, we are supposed to be singing to God, but we're also supposed to be singing to each other to encourage each other. This is one of the many reasons why it's so important to actually come to church. Because we can't sing to each other if we're not actually with each other. You see, we are all members of the choir here at Valley Baptist Church. If you are a member of Valley, then you're in the choir whether you're on stage or not. Because all of us are supposed to be singing to the Lord and to each other. Now the interesting thing about this verse is this verse is not a suggestion. This verse is a command. It says, be filled with the Spirit, sing. And yet, sometimes Christians don't sing. Now, I completely get why non-Christians wouldn't sing in church. That makes, that makes sense. But why would a Christian who believes in Jesus not sing in church? <clears throat> Some Christians are too embarrassed to sing out loud in public. Sometimes we are too focused on what other people think about us instead of what God thinks about us. Sometimes we're too focused on how we feel instead of how God feels. But we got to get that straightened out real quick. Our Christian life will be a disaster if we care more about what other people think about us than what God thinks about us. Men especially are prone to this temptation of getting embarrassed when it comes to singing. Some men feel sort of macho and kind of feel silly singing in front of other people. But those same men will hoot like a wild baboon when their football team scores, and they'll do that hooting in front of everybody, right? Those same men will go to a Brad Paisley concert and belt out every word of every song in front of everybody. Now, men, not only does God deserve for you to sing to him, your family needs to see you singing to God, especially your sons. They're watching you, and they're going to follow your lead. Fathers who don't praise God create sons who don't praise God. Teenagers also struggle with this embarrassment factor. Sometimes teenagers are too cool to sing in church. But then those same teenagers will go home and record a silly Instagram video of themselves singing and dancing along to their favorite song. And what do they do with that video? They post it on the internet for the entire world to see. Sometimes us Christians don't sing because we don't know the song. The song is new to us. But you know what I found? The fastest way to learn a new song is just to try my best to sing along with it even though I don't really know the song yet. Some Christians refuse to sing as sort of a way to protest how much they hate the music or how much they hate the people on stage. But although those Christians are trying to hurt their brothers and sisters in Christ, what they're really doing is robbing God of the praise that he deserves. Sometimes the answer why Christians don't sing at church is perhaps because they're not filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5 seems to imply that one of the results of being filled with the Spirit is that we're going to want to sing. That sort of nothing can stop us from just bursting forth in praise and song. The second thing we see in Ephesians 5 of what it means to be filled with the Spirit is being grateful and expressing thankfulness. Look with me in Ephesians 5 at verse 20. Paul says, Giving thanks always for all things, to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Most of us spend more time asking God for things than we do thanking God for the things that he's already given us. But when we are filled with the Spirit, we can't help but be thankful. One of the most radical parts of verse 20 is when it says that we should give thanks to the Lord always for all things. Now that's easy to say, but what about those times in our life when everything seems to be going wrong? Well, I've learned 
that there is always something to be thankful for in every situation. We just have to train our minds to actually look for it. One man said that the key to life is to focus on the donut and not the whole. To focus on what we do have, not on what we don't have. Let me give you an example with my injuries. A few months ago, I fell and I broke my pelvis and I severed the ACL in my knee. But even in the midst of all that pain and and difficulty, there are still so many things that I can be thankful. I'm thankful that when I fell, my cell phone landed close enough to me that I could reach it and call the ambulance. I'm thankful that we have modern medicine. Amen? I'm thankful that I broke my pelvis and not my head or my neck. I'm thankful that I wasn't hurt worse. In the hospital, there were a lot of people who were way worse off than me. I'm thankful that although I severed my ACL, that I didn't tear my meniscus like often happens with an ACL tear. I'm thankful that God helped me to endure the horrific pain that I was in before the surgery. I'm thankful that God got me to a great surgeon who eats complex hip surgeries for breakfast. (laughs) There was a point after my surgery that I was thankful for. After my surgery, I was having difficulty getting a prescription filled for some blood thinners that I desperately needed to help protect me against post-operative blood clots. And I was having a lot of trouble. Days were going by, and I couldn't get this prescription filled. But I am thankful that there just so happened to be a pharmacist who also was a member of Valley Baptist Church. (laughs) Amen. And uh, she made a whole bunch of phone calls and got everything straightened out for me. I'm thankful that I don't have a manual labor job. In my line of work, as long as my mouth works... I could still do 99% of my job, but if I was working in construction or something, I'd be sunk. I don't know what I'd be doing right now. I'm thankful that we have a great church, a church that prayed for me and, and, and helped me out in so many other ways. I'm thankful for a great staff here at the church that covered for me during the two and a half weeks that I was in the hospital. I'm thankful for a great wife and great daughters who have helped me every step of the way. I'm thankful that my car is an automatic and not a stick shift. (laughs) Working a clutch would have been extremely unpleasant. I'm thankful that just this week, I'm finally able to sleep on my side. I like to sleep on my side, but for two and a half months, I've only been able to sleep on my back. But this week, I've finally been able to turn to my side. That is a huge blessing that we take for granted sometimes. And now, I'm thankful that I've been cleared to walk, even if I'm not walking very well yet. But here's the deal. As we, amen. Amen. Here's the deal. As we live and as we worship, we should be constantly looking for reasons to be grateful. Now, is that how we live life? Usually not. Usually we go through life and worship and church looking for things to complain about. But if we're filled with the Spirit, then we are going to be on the lookout, circumspectly looking all around for things to be grateful for. Now, it might be helpful to actually make a list of everything in your life that you can think of to be thankful to God for. You're probably going to need multiple pieces of paper or a lot of pages on your your Word document. Now, this kind of list could be so useful in our daily lives. I mean, think about how we could use a list like that. We could use it in our prayer time. Imagine how it might transform our prayer time is if if we began every time of prayer with working through that long list of all the things that we should be thanking God for. We can pull out a list like that any time that we're depressed or anxious. That can help us to cope with those times in our life. What if every Sunday morning you pulled out that list and went over it before church? What if every Sunday morning on the way to church, you asked your family to share some things that happened that week that they could be thankful to God for? Can you imagine how that might warm our hearts and prepare us for worship? Because gratitude is the fuel that feeds the flame of worship. The third and final thing that it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit in this passage is yielding to one another in the church. Look with me again at Ephesians chapter 5, this time in verse 21. It says, Submitting 
to one another in the fear of God. Now, this is kind of a surprising twist at the end of this passage. I would expect a passage about being filled with the Spirit to end with a verse talking about submitting to God. But this passage ends with a verse that talks about submitting to other Christians. You see, there are situations in the Christian life that will require us to submit to other people. In the coming weeks, we're going to see examples of specific ways that Christians are required to submit to each other because the next couple of chapters flush out this idea for us. Paul's going to show us what this submission looks like in marriage, in parenting, and in the workplace. But here's the problem with submission. Submission doesn't come easily for us, does it? Submission doesn't come easily for us because we are sinners. Sin was born out of a desire to not submit, to instead rebel. Submission also does not come easy for us because we are Americans. America was born out of a desire to not submit, to revolt. And that kind of thinking still resides in the American psyche today. Well, that kind of thinking becomes disastrous when we bring that into the church. When we refuse in the church to give up our rights and our preferences and our opinions for the good of others. We've got to get over ourselves, people. And here's the thing. I know that that's not easy. I know it. To obey what this verse is talking about requires a radical shift in how we think about life and how we think about church. You see, we usually want other people in church to submit to us, to submit to our opinions and our wants and our ideas and our needs. But you know what? That's not what church is about. Church is not primarily about us. Church is about all of us together submitting to Jesus and to each other. You see, church is supposed to be about God first, others second, and ourselves last. Now, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this point because the next three sermons are going to flush this idea out. But what we've seen this morning is that we need to live out our identity in Christ by being wise about the decisions that we make. And we've seen that the key to being wise in life is being filled with the Holy Spirit. So here's the million-dollar question. How do we become filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, that could be a sermon in and of itself. But the first step is to receive the Holy Spirit in the first place. And the only way to do that is to believe in Jesus. You see, the moment we believe in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. The Bible teaches that all of us have sinned. And our sin is so serious that it separates us from God and sadly earns us eternal judgment. And that's bad news. And no matter how hard we try to be a good person, no matter how many rules we try to keep or how many good deeds we try to do, none of us can ever be good enough to earn our own way to heaven. None of us can solve the problem of our own sin. But the good news is that God loves us so much, he made a way to solve the problem that we've created. 2,000 years ago, God sent his only son, Jesus, into this broken, messed up world. And Jesus lived the perfect, sinless life in our place because all of us have failed to live that perfect life. And at the end of Jesus' perfect life, he died on the cross for our sins, taking the punishment that we were supposed to get. And on the third day, Jesus came back from the dead. And the Bible says that now because of what Jesus has done, not because of what we've done, but because of what Jesus has done, all of us have a grand opportunity Anyone who will recognize that they've sinned, who will be willing to turn away from their old life, and in the same moment will believe in Jesus, can be saved, can be forgiven, can be transformed. And so I want to beg you, won't you please believe in Jesus today? Won't you receive the Holy Spirit and begin today the process of learning how to walk in wisdom? In just a moment, we're going to have what we call a time of invitation. And I'm going to invite you to give your life to Jesus. 
If you're watching on a screen of some sort, there'll be a phone number that you can call. But here at the Fruitvale campus and also at the Olive Drive campus, we're going to stand and we're going to sing, and there's going to be people here at the front who would love to help you with whatever God is doing in your heart. Is God working in your heart this morning? Is he stirring something within you? Is he bringing you to that moment of spiritual clarity? Perhaps this morning, you feel that tug and you know that you need to give your life to Jesus. If that's you, don't wait. The second we stand and start singing, come forward so someone can help you with that. Maybe you've been thinking about getting baptized, but you've kind of been procrastinating and and putting that off. If you're thinking about getting baptized, don't wait. You don't want to wait to take that step of obedience and go public with your faith. Come forward. We'd love to talk to you about baptism. Maybe you've been considering joining this church and you've reached the point where you go, you know what, I want to officially be on the team. I want Valley Baptist Church to be my spiritual home. If that's you, come forward so we can help you with that. Maybe you need to rededicate your life. Maybe you've been drifting away from God for a long time. But I want to let you know, although you may feel like you have left God. God has never left you. What greater day could there be to come back to Jesus than today? Maybe this morning you need some prayer. Prayer for something going on in your life or in the life of someone you care about. If that's you, as soon as we stand and start singing, don't wait. Come forward so that somebody can pray with you. We are a praying church. We would love to pray with you. Maybe you know somebody who is in the grips of addiction. Maybe you know someone whose life is being destroyed by alcohol or by drugs. If that's you, you have a responsibility to pray for them. And I want to encourage you, don't take that responsibility lightly. Come forward. Lift that person up in prayer that God will help them to find freedom through Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that Jesus wants you to do right now, don't do it. Don't do it. <laughs> Whatever it is that Jesus wants you to do right now, do it. Just do it. Follow whatever it is that Jesus is doing in your life right now. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, you only want the best for us. And so God, I pray, Lord, that you will make it clear in our hearts right now what it is that you want us to do from the preaching of your word today. God, I pray that you will give anyone who needs to make a decision this morning the strength to stand up and to come forward and, and to tell someone about it. Lord, for anyone who needs prayer, God, I pray, Lord, that you will help them to come forward and get the prayer that they desperately need this morning. Lord, please be with us. Just help us to follow you in this holy moment. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This is our time of invitation. I'd like to invite you to please stand. If you have a decision that God's leading you to, Come forward so someone can help you with that. If you need some prayer right now, don't wait. Come forward and get the prayer that you need right now. Take all I have in these hands and multiply. God, all that I am and find my heart on the altar again. Set me on fire. Set me on fire Take all I have in these hands and multiply God, all that I am and find my heart On the altar again Set me on fire Set me on fire
to Jesus now. All to Jesus now. Holding nothing back. Holding nothing back. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender. Here I am, God. Here I am, God. Arms wide open. Pouring out my life, gracefully broken. And here I am, God, arms wide open, pouring out my life, gracefully broken. God bless you and thank you. You may be seated. As you're being seated, I'd like to say a quick word to our guests. If this is your first time here, we are glad that you're here, and I would love to personally meet you. Right after the service, as you walk out these doors into the foyer, if you look to the right, you'll see a room that says guest information. I'm going to be there. We'll have some other members of our staff team there. We also have um, a small gift that we'd like to give you for being a first-time guest with us here today. And so I want to invite you to stop by right after the service. It only takes a couple of minutes. And what it's all about is we would just love the opportunity to thank you for coming and to answer any questions that you might have. So thank you. And God bless you. And Pastor Patrick, come forward. All right. If you enjoyed that message, would you say amen? Amen. amen. All right, guys, well, we want to turn your attention to the bulletin. Uh, you should have received one as you were coming inside. On the bottom of your bulletin, there is a Connect card, and on there, there are a few decisions, or maybe you're interested in joining a life group, or maybe you have a prayer request. Uh, that card is our way to serve you as a church, and, so, uh, and also for you to register your attendance, which is incredibly important for us. So if you guys can start filling that out now before we take our offering, um, which brings us to our offering, there are two ways that you can give here at Valley. So in front of you, there are envelopes that um, that you can uh, put your offering inside, and then as the ushers go by, you can put inside, or you can text GIVE to 88988 and give electronically, uh, and they'll send you a link through that text message there. So those are our two ways to give. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward, and we're going to pray for this morning's offering. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you so much, Lord, for the faithful giving every week that we receive. And Lord, we pray that you multiply these gifts, Lord, um, and that your kingdom work that can just continue to be done. And Lord, we just thank you so much, Lord, for what you bless us with. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if you're aware of this, but now in Kern County, we are 56% Hispanic. And here at Valley Baptist Church, we'd like to say that we are one church in multiple languages. And one of those languages being Valley Baptist Espanol. Valley Baptist Espanol now has two services at different campuses. We have a service at the campus on Fruitville, and we have a service at the campus at Mount Vernon. Our Mount Vernon campus has done some amazing things. And first of all, I wanna take time just to thank you for all your donations and thank you for your prayers. We have been able to remodel the children's area. You have no idea how joyful that's been to see kids light up when they walk into a room that has been completely remodeled and designed for them. We are working with our schools here in our area at Mount Vernon campus. Not often do you get to go to a school and share the gospel, but the schools here have allowed us to step on campuses and sign up kids for VBS. Over the last few years, we have seen hundreds and hundreds of kids give their lives to Christ as they spend a week with us hearing the gospel and being here for VBS. We've been able to upgrade our 
sound systems, our lighting systems, and uh, also been able to do a lot of painting. One of the things that we have started here for the Mount Vernon campus specifically, it's really an outreach to the community, is we, we have a soccer tournament every March. And over the last two years, we have seen over 400 people on this campus. We're so grateful for the ministry that is happening here and cannot wait to continue to reach people for Christ at either of our campuses. Now, something unique about the Mount Vernon campus is that the Mount Vernon campus is the only campus, I would say, in the entire county that is hosting Celebrate Recovery in Spanish. It has been such a gift to our community, to our families, to our members, to our visitors, to finally have a place where they can come and work on their habits and their hang-ups. And, and not only that, but to hear it in their own language. If you wanna know more information about Valley Baptist Espanol, please go to our website where you can look at service times, you can uh, get to hear us more, and also if you know somebody who speaks Spanish, we would love if you invite them to Valley Baptist Espanol. We are grateful for the ministry that we get to do either at Fruitsville or the Mount Vernon campus because together as Valley Baptist Church, we are trusting Jesus, we are walking with God, and we are joining the mission.